right here. You are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other. Reach You are. you are my strength. Yeah. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. No other. And we change.
Elmwood United Presbyterian Church is excited to welcome home Damian Connors. Damian is a program officer at the Kettering Foundation. His work focuses on what people can do collectively to address problems affecting their lives, their communities, and their nation to ensure democracy functions as it should. Damien has served in executive leadership for nearly 10 years, supporting equity-based efforts in the Hawaii Department of Education, Kamahamea Schools, American Library Association, and United Way organizations across the country. His work extends to Africa, Europe, and Asia. Damien served as the National Executive Director and COO of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization led and co-founded by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In 2013, Damien was honored with the Emancipation of Capital Award for his strategic and programmatic work around building coalitions to address socioeconomic equity in the United States. Damien has received a number of awards, commendations, and honors. Most notably, he has been recognized for his commitment to civil rights and social justice by the West Point Military Academy and the state of New Jersey. Damien is a preacher, teacher, strategist, and political activist whose work is rooted in his call to serve the least of these. Damien graduated from Ramapo College of New Jersey, where he received a BA degree in political science. He earned a Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary, receiving a certificate in women's studies and a certificate in black church. He earned his Master's of Theology from Emory University. He is also a lecturer and teaching associate at Emory University from 2009 to 2014. In 2014, he received a certificate in King Nonviolence Conflict Resolution from the University of Rhode Island. Grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father and Mother. And what is always a privilege and pleasure to be with you in worship. And I'm excited to be with you and sharing the word of God with you today. I'm grateful to Pastor Maria for the invitation to share with you and what is home for me. So I'm glad to be back home and to share and worship with you today. And lest I take too much time, I would ask that you would join me in grabbing your Bibles and turning with me to the 54th chapter of the book of Psalms. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Um, and so whatever text you have, it may be a little bit different than the one that I have, but I ask that you join me in reading this scripture. I will be reading this chapter in its entirety. So please join me as we uh, explore the word of God together. Psalm 54 reads, Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth, for the insolent have risen against me. The ruthless seek my life. They do not set God before them. But surely, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil, and your faithfulness put an end to them. With a freewill offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemy. Would you pray with me? O oh God, we thank you for another day, for another opportunity to give your name praise, honor, and glory. We ask today that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. God, that you create in us clean hearts and renew within us right spirits, that we may worship you. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I ask that you join me as we preach from the sermon topic, 
a reason to rejoice. If we were in person, I would say, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, I have a reason to rejoice. The Psalms are some of the most treasured scriptures in the Bible. At some point or another in our lives and across our lives, even for those who have no official affiliation with the church, we've heard a psalm. Psalms are the scriptures that make it into movies, on tattoos, and on wall art. The psalms are like the timeless cookout music that everybody starts moving to at the same time, like Before I Let Go by Frankie Beverly and Mays, You Are My Friend by Kenny Bobian, or maybe even for the new school Hot Girl Summer by Meg The Stallion. The Psalms are like those classic songs or poems that hit the right note at the right time. The Psalms have the inimitable quality of producing peace or provoking a praise. You know the Psalms. The Psalms are like your favorite hymn of rejoicing, blessed assurance, or, or be not dismayed, or amazing grace, or we're marching to Zion. You know the Psalms. You know Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. You know Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Surely you're familiar with the Psalm with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He make me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still water. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the sea and established it upon the flood. Who shall ascend unto the hills of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He or she who has clean hands and a pure heart. Mm. Beyond the hymnody and poetry of the, that textures these texts, the Psalms are often the most recognizable scripture in the Bible because they channel, carry, and convey with certain spiritual exactness our experiences and emotions. They often tell the story that we're not articulate or eloquent enough to put into words ourselves. In other words, we can rock with the Psalms because no matter how antiquated the language or Victorian the transliterated poetry, the Psalms, these songs, put into words much of what we have felt or experienced at some point or another in our lives. I know I have about two or three witnesses here. The Psalms speak to our emotions and thinking and feeling and have the capacity to conjure in us memories of past moments and experiences with God. These songs, these psalms have the uncanny ability to pull from us memories that color the pages of our experiences with God. Ah, David, you know David, Jesse's son. David, who with a slingshot and a sword killed a menacing Philistinian giant named Goliath. David, the psalmist. David, the one who put pen to parchment to produce this psalm as a means of sharing his frustration with the situation in which he found himself. In this, the second division and 54th chapter of the Psalms, we find David frustrated, hiding from Saul, waiting for relief. Scholars suggest that this psalm was written in response to what David was experiencing in 1 Samuel 23 and 24. David was on the run, attempting to escape from Saul, the king of Judah, Saul for whom David had fought and won. Saul, a man of great power and influence. Saul, an insecure king, uh, that's kind of an oxymoron, right? A, a man who felt threatened by David because David, uh, with just a few men, had gone to Keilah and defeated a band of Philistines who planned to attack the people of Judah. In your personal time, I recommend that you go over to 1 Samuel and read chapters 23 and 24. Uh, and, Saul, and, and, and that text records that Saul was jealous. So instead of finding ways to put David's skill and warrior prowess to good use, the text records that Saul instead plots to kill or have David murdered. And in response, David goes into hiding. If the truth be told, my brothers and my sisters, we have all had to deal with a few Saul's in our lives. Somebody say amen. People who, 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 who had the power and position to help us mount the pulpits of our purpose, but instead felt threatened by our potential. Instead of celebrating uh, a God-sent warrior, Saul was salty about David's unmatched and undeniable ability and skill. And it is a sad day. 
It's a sad day when people in positions of influence and power are so insecure and lack the spiritual maturity to steward their authority in ways that are life-giving and gift-affirming. I think I better say that one more time. It's a sad day when people who are in positions of power and influence are so insecure and lack the spiritual maturity to steward their authority in ways that are life-giving and gift-affirming. Somebody say amen right there. If you need to tap it, type it in the chat box. Just type it there. Type amen. People who'd rather condemn than grant mercy. People who'd rather sabotage than save. People who'd rather undermine than encourage. We've all had an experience or two with a Saul in our lives. We've experienced a Saul on our jobs. We've had a run-in or two with a Saul at church. Some preacher friends have had preaching invitations rescinded because of a Saul. You may have even experienced a Saul in your home. And this is where David finds himself in the text, frustrated and hiding from Saul, a man who couldn't understand how David, a young man, one who lacked experience, could come on the scene and conquer in ways that Saul could not. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but don't be Saul. Somebody turn to your virtual neighbor and say, neighbor, don't be Saul. Saul is that person at church who complains about everything. Yeah, the youth choir was all right today, but they did too much jumping around for me. That's a saw. Yeah, the preacher, she was all right, but she was just too loud for me today. That's a saw. Yeah, the scholarship banquet is potentially, could potentially be nice, a nice idea, but I can use my money to go to Cancun. That's a saw. Tell somebody in your home, in your car, in the chat box, wherever you are, don't be a saw. Don't allow your ego to, to, don't allow your ego to lock you into dysfunctionality. But David is tucked away. He's hiding in the hills among the Zephites. Somebody say Zephites. David, in essence, has his bubble. David is quarantining with the Zephites, a mountain clan who he thought he could trust. David had ostensibly found refuge in a place where he believed Saul would not be able to find him. But the Zephites, who had allowed David to hide among them, his quarantine compatriots, turned out to be some shady characters. The Zephites ended up telling Saul where David was hiding. David, fresh out of an exhausting labor latent battle. David, running for his life in a mountainous wilderness. David, attempting to escape the petulant pursuit of a petty king. David, who thought he, he could trust the Zephites only, only for them to disclose his location to Saul. David had a lot going on. And as the senior saints would say, if it wasn't one thing for David, it was another. But isn't it like life sometimes? David is going from one situation to another, one drama to another, one issue to another. If it, if it isn't COVID, then it's the Delta variant. And if it isn't COVID and the Delta variant, it's the mask or it's a vaccine. If it's not the mortgage, it's the car note. If it's not the job, it's the spouse. If it's not the spouse, it's the children. If it's not the children, it's the dog. If it's not the dog or the children, it's the family member. If it's not the family member, it's the church member. If it's not the church member, it's somebody on the street. And if it's not one thing, it's another. And this is why David pins this song. And we understand it and we can relate to it because we've all been there. We've all been through periods or moments in our lives or we're going through periods or, in a, or, or are in a moment in our lives where our problems seem to be compounding. We're tired. We're hiding. We're waiting for the weight of life to give us some breathing room, waiting for some to find some relief. David's psalm is the kind of gospel song that you turn up when you're riding in the car because that's your testimony. The kind of psalm you put on repeat because you want to believe that God hears and God sees you. A song you sing at the top of your lungs, uh, uh, at the top of your voice, because you want God to handle your enemies. The details may not be the same, but it's easy to get with because the song resonates so deeply with you. It articulately and eloquently puts into words how you're feeling. And David like so many of us, is waiting. He was waiting, waiting for peace, waiting for joy, waiting for strength, 
waiting for hope, waiting for things to just, to, to just get back to normal. And amid all the ups and downs this pandemic has brought with it, many of us like David are waiting for some relief and a sense of normalcy. And along the way, we've experienced a solitude. We've laid up and socialized with some z -fights. We had to fight some Philistines. David had prayed and gotten permission from God to do what Saul was envious of. Saul didn't understand that his issue wasn't with David. His issue really was with God. And that's what you have to remember, child of God. When you encounter a Saul or a Zephite, you have to turn them over to God. You cannot allow life's circumstances and the misdirected energy of people to take you off track or to reroute your focus. You cannot allow haters uh, to derail your momentum in pursuit of purpose in the plans that God has for your life. If God said it, that settles it. The promises of God are yea and amen. David had been anointed by God. David had been gifted by God. David had been directed by God, not only for some self-aggrandizing pursuit of success for himself, but for the good of God's people. Your gifts are not for you. Your gifts are not about you. It's about what God is doing through you to deliver the people around you. And selfish, me-centered people miss an opportunity to partner with God because they are too consumed with self. Somebody in your, in your virtual, uh, tell your virtual neighbor in the words of Kendrick Lamar, be humble and sit down. Don't be a Saul. Don't be a Z-fight. The Z-fights uh, uh, could have proven their character by keeping David's secret. But they revealed their lack of reliability and integrity. And, 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 and this is the nature of dealing with self-centered, ego-driven people who center themselves above the good of the whole. So they protest vaccines. They refuse to wear masks. They deny funding to schools. They'll lie. They'll plot. They'll scheme. They'll sabotage. They'll undermine. They'll betray. And they'll backstab. But every once in a while, we have to pause and thank God for revealing the snakes in the grass. Every once in a while, we have to stop to consider what God is doing in our lives to bring into full manifestation the purpose and promises that God has for our lives. And in his frustration, David says, save me, O God, by your name. And vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For the insolent have risen against me and the ruthless seek my life. They do not set God before them. And then we get to verse four. When David says, but surely, somebody say, but surely, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. And for a while, I tried to figure out what happened between verses three and verses four. I was trying to figure out how David went from hurt to hope. I tried to understand how David went from, from, from presenting his problems to, pro, to, pro, to proclamations of praise. I was unclear about what happened in the span of one verse to move David from weeping to worshiping. And as I read the text, I discovered some tension. But I also discovered some good news. And I noticed David's song was punctuated by a seemingly insignificant five letter word nestled obscurely at the margins of the text. And that word was Selah. Selah is what stood between David's problem and David's praise. Selah, this margin-bound five-letter word, stood between David's weeping and David's worshiping. Selah was the psychological, spiritual, and emotional pivot in perspective David needed to remember he had a reason to rejoice. The word Selah in the Psalms generally means to pause and reflect, or that there is a change in key in the Psalms. In other words, when the beat dropped and the key changed and the tempo may have sped up just a little bit, and after David took a moment to, to pause and reflect, I believe David had a shift in perspective that was connected to the fact that he had a memory. 
Ah, this is a place to shout right here. David said, but... He uses this, this contravening conjunction, conjunction that when placed in the sentences of our lives has the power to negate everything that came before it. He says, but surely God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil and your faithfulness put an end to them with a free will offering. I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. David returns his pressure into praise. Do I have anybody in the, in the virtual worship this morning who is ready to turn their pressure into praise. David turns his pressure into praise by remembering what God had already done in his life, by remembering what God already had the capacity and capability to do and to bring to pass in his life, what God had already been doing and what God had already done in David's life. David remembered that, he, that when his back had been pressed against the wall, the proverbial wall of the past, God was his way out and that God kept him then and God had the power and the resources to keep him now. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you have a reason to rejoice. Despite what's going on in the world and what's going on around you, you have a reason to rejoice. God has been your helper. God has kept and sustained you. God has blessed and covered you. God has restored and revived you. God has made ways for you. God has opened doors for you. And though your situation may be that one thing is happening after another today, that doesn't change the fact that you've had more victories than you've had losses. And even your losses turned out to be lessons. Somebody ought to say amen. Somebody ought to type amen in the chat. Because despite everything you've been through, despite where you've been, despite what people have done, you've had more victories than you've had losses. Your losses have even been lessons, and that's a reason to rejoice. You've had more triumphs than you've had trials. So despite COVID, despite wars and rumors of wars, despite vaccine hysteria, despite dysfunction at home, despite drama on the job, despite the unexpected loneliness of retirement, despite separation from friends, friends and family, despite not being able to connect with your loved ones, despite not being able to go into the sanctuary for worship, you have a reason to rejoice. And your reason to rejoice is that God is your helper. And God has a track record across the span of your life that says that even through dangers, toils, and snares, God has been faithful in your life. And that's a good place to praise him. I invite you to go into the chat box and say, Lord, I thank you uh, because I recognize that it's only been you who has kept me. God, I give you praise. Uh, God, I put my hands together. God, I throw my head back uh, and I just extend my worship to you uh, because you've been so good to me. Uh, despite everything that I've done, uh, despite everything that's been done to me, uh, God, you've been faithful uh, and your faithfulness is found in the fact uh, that I'm still here. David reminds us that no matter where we find ourselves along life's journey, God is our helper. And that's good news today, church, because the truth of the matter is we can't help ourselves like God can help us. There's some doors that we don't have the capacity or ability to open, but God can. There's some ways that only God can make. There's some covering that only God can do. There's some blessings that only God can bestow. There are, And then that's our reason to rejoice, because despite everything we've been through, we can say that God has been faithful and through everything that we've experienced and through everything that's happening and everything that's happened, our testimony is we're still here. Out of everything we've been through, we ought to have joy because we're still here. We have a reason to rejoice. Ah, uh, That's a reason to rejoice, a reason to say thank you, a reason to give God glory, a reason to celebrate, a reason to just be thankful because God has been consistent, because God has been faithful, God has been gracious and merciful, and God is bigger than any circumstance in which we found ourselves. So when you're feeling defeated, I invite you to pause and reflect. And remember, you have a reason to rejoice. God is the preeminent indomitable power who sits squarely in the center and circumference of our lives and daily bestows blessings that we're often too ungrateful to remember. Ah, but 
But I know that there's some folks on this virtual worship stream today who when the beat drops and the key changes, you remember just how faithful God has been in your life. God strengthened you to overcome that addiction. That's a reason to rejoice. God kept you in the midst of an abusive relationship. That's a reason to rejoice. When you were laid off and didn't know how ends were going to meet, God became the ends and the meat. That's a reason to rejoice. When people drug your name through the mud, God covered you. That's a reason to rejoice. When you threw in the towel and God threw it back, that's a reason to rejoice. David said, but surely. Somebody look at your, your virtual neighbor and say, but surely. Type it in the chat box. But surely God is my helper. So this week, this week, when you're walking through the grocery store, I invite you to remember how good God has been to you. I invite you to remember all of the ways that God has kept you. I invite you to remember God's faithfulness in your life. I invite you to remember that you have a reason to rejoice. And so our text today provides us with a reminder that when life is getting the best of us, when our problems and troubles seem to be compounding, when it's one thing after another, we ought to take a moment to pause, to reflect, and to remember God's goodness to us. And remember that we have a reason to rejoice. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God.